Shabbat Shalom, my friends. I am sending loving greetings today to my wife, Risa, because June 5th is her 80th birthday. Risa, you are the one who sustains my life in joy, even as you have built a world of meaning through all of your own accomplishments. I do want to point out that June 5th in 1967 was the starting day of the Six-Day War. My birthday is October 6th, and October 6th in 1973 was the start of the Yom Kippur War. No implied meaning here at all. I don't want to look to tarot cards, to Kabbalah, to Gematria to point out for me the direction of my life. I'm just saying two birth dates, two wars, and a wonderful marriage. Our Sedra is Shlach Lecha, Numbers 13, verse 1 and following. So let's begin with a brief excursus into the third eye. We were in Nepal, in Kathmandu to be precise. It was there that we learned about the role of a stupa, S-T-U-P-A, in Buddhist lore. And it was there that we stood in stunned silence before the uh, Buddhanath stupa, a 700-year-old Tibetan Buddhist meditative structure, one of the largest of its kind in the world, a giant dome, and on top of which is perched a Buddhist pyramid tower. There are pairs of eyes everywhere on this stupa. Their eyes were looking in all four directions, of course, but more, those eyes were looking everywhere and you knew it, seeing everything, looking down at us as we were feeling puny by comparison. The image of the Buddha had a third eye set in the middle of his forehead. That third eye symbolizes wisdom, wisdom that exists far beyond the physical realm. And that third eye is set in the middle of the forehead, asking people to see beyond that which ordinary eyes can see, to see the world with their inner eye, with their mind, to see the world with their mind. Quite a concept. In our Sedra, Moses sends forth 12 individuals to explore the promised land. You know this story, and you know how it tragically ends. 12 are sent in, 12 return. All praise the land's fertility, emphasizing the seven grains typical of the land. But 10 of the 12 saw only failure, dread, and fear regarding the Israelite enterprise. There were giants everywhere. The cities were heavily fortified. The challenges to a conquest of Canaan were overwhelming. It can't be done, they reported. It cannot be done. Two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, reported otherwise. They relied upon God's promises. They relied upon the covenant. They said that the Israelite dream was still within their people's grasp. The message of the two was scorned. The message of the, day, the ten carried the day. So the people revolted against Moses' vision and the will of God. For this act of rebellion, for this fatal act of defeatism, the people were condemned by God to wander in the desert for an additional 38, total 40 years until the Exodus generation would die out and a new generation of Israelites would enter the land. Now, in all likelihood, at least as far as I am aware, this story of the 12 spies was written long after the Jewish settlement of Canaan was established, perhaps during the 
later period of the kingdoms. This wasn't an eyewitness account as to how things went so tragically bad in the desert. This wasn't an I told you so story that would give additional support for Joshua being ultimately elevated to succeed Moses. This was, in my eyes, most likely a cautionary tale regarding the challenges that the Israelite homeland was in fact actually confronting, confronted in their own day. Now, the story of the Twelve has served for several thousand years as a kind of Jewish stupa. You must learn how to see. I believe that the elements of the story in the book of Numbers contained a contemporary truth, a contemporary reality, retrojected back into the wilderness wandering. So what was that contemporary truth and that contemporary reality? There are enemies out there, enemies on our borders. There really are. Their armies are greater than our own. With battle armor and with machines of war, those enemies do in fact seem to resemble mythical giants. What we currently possess, look around, is a land blessed with rich agricultural resources. But that won't prove to be enough. We will be like grasshoppers, destined only to be stumped upon and then scraped off the sandals of our oppressors. If we try to do battle, if we attempt to resist, we will be crushed. The contemporary truth, the contemporary reality, also contained, the other side, the vision, the perspective of those who felt otherwise without denying the power of those threatening enemies, the dissenters said that they should maintain their faith in the covenant linking Israel with God. They should trust in their own capacity to defend, to resist, and ultimately to survive. So there were some who looked at their world with physical eyes. They saw what they saw. In that sense, hey, they saw accurately. They did the calculations and the assessments and then rendered their verdict. We can't survive here. There were others who saw the same situation with the third eye. With the eye perched in the middle of their foreheads that allowed them, if they so choose, to see with their minds and to see with their hearts. Those others were perhaps typified by the prophet Jeremiah. Remember the story? Who, as he properly noted the impending devastation to be brought upon his people by the Babylonians, nevertheless went out, bought some land, probably got a good price, carefully buried the deeds of purchase, so that they could be reclaimed later on when the people, Jeremiah's descendants included, return to the land. They trusted that the coming nightmare could never stand up against the will of the people and the promises of God. By the way, this is also like the prophet Ezekiel living as an exile in Babylonia who set the stage for the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple. He did not agree to disappear. The ten spies in our Sedra weren't blind. They saw clearly enough with their physical eyes and they crumbled before what they saw. The two spies, Joshua and Caleb, heroes of our people, conquerors of Canaan, they saw differently. Could anyone who possessed only physical eyes 
ever have seen that it would take less than a year to create a vaccine capable of stopping a devastating pandemic in its tracks. Could anyone, 10 months? Could anyone who had only physical eyes ever have seen that not only would those who took up arms against the British monarchy defeat one of the great armies in the world, but would ultimately nurture into existence one of the most powerful countries ever to have existed? Could anyone with only physical eyes ever have projected that a battered, crushed people could rise up in their homeland after 2,000 years and build a third commonwealth, a third Jewish commonwealth, that in so many ways, though sadly not in all ways yet, expresses the values, the dreams, the hopes, the future of the Jewish people. Could anyone have seen that with physical eyes? We live in painful, desperate, frightening times. Far too often, those who see with only physical eyes are swamped and disabled by despair. Understandably so. But that is not the only way to see. With hope and with trust and with vision, we can yet come to possess the promised land of our dreams. Here in the United States, there in Israel, there in the world. Wouldn't Shabbat be a wonderful time to learn how to open our own inner eyes? Yes, I know there is a third eye record store in Jerusalem, a McRefaim, but I'm not going to mention that. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.